Welcome to the Retention Nation podcast, the show for e-commerce brands looking to turn one-time and sometime buyers into lifetime and forever customers. Hosted by Isaac Hyman, an ex-VP of retention and featured speaker, author, masterclass creator, and founder of High Flyer Digital, each episode features successful brands, apps, and experts who are sharing cutting-edge, innovative, and proven email SMS retention insights that help them grow their business to the next level profitably. Our mission is to give you the retention strategies you need to unlock profitable, predictable, and scalable revenue from every customer on your list. Let's get started. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Retention Nation podcast. I'm your host, Isaac Hyman, and we're talking all about how e-commerce brands can turn those one-time and sometime buyers that they have on their list into lifetime buyers and actually unlock the true revenue potential from every subscriber on their list. And when you do that, you create profitable, predictable, and sustainable and scalable revenues for your business. And who doesn't want that? That's really key to growing your business. So super excited to jump into this episode with our guest, I'm going to introduce in a second, Andrew Moscow, who has a ton of experience working with some of the biggest brands in the world on UX, DTC, retention, acquisition, you name it. So I'm going to dive into, get into that with him in a second. As I always recommend, if you really want to understand the secret strategies of the top brands and how they're doing email, SMS, and retention extremely well, highly recommend you get a copy of my 330 page email SMS playbook, ultimate e-commerce email SMS playbook out here, 330 pages of goodness. If you don't read it, it's a good paperweight as well. So um, that will give you some good insights. I already sent Andrew a copy, um, a couple of them, and a uh, really good, useful guy to get moving. But as I always say, it's one thing to read about it. It's one thing to watch about it. But really, the magic happens when you listen to it from the experts that are doing it really, really well. So I really want to take a minute to introduce my guest today was Andrew Moscow who again, as I said before, has a ton of experience in retention. Um, I'm going to go through his bio really quickly before he says hello. Uh, Andrew is currently the VP of the Direct-to-Consumer DTC area of Juiced Bikes, also the director of DTC at Stanley Black & Decker. He was a senior director of DTC at Hearst and led the DTC initiatives at OXO, where he actually achieved a Webby Award honor for the best UX, so he definitely knows what he's talking about. And from a personal side, I personally worked with uh, uh, Andrew back at my time at Adorama and really saw firsthand some of the expertise he brings to the table. And I just wish we had more time together because I would have picked his brain a lot more. But um, welcome, Andrew. Thanks for being a guest here. And maybe you can share a little bit about uh, where you've been over the past few years and how it shaped your DTC journey. Awesome. Thank you, Isaac. I'm glad to be here. Um, my background, as you said, is direct to consumer digital marketing, um, and everything around driving sales through a direct channel. Um, I currently am a direct to consumer lead at Juiced Bikes. Um, we are a high premium luxury e-bike organization. Um, some of the most strongest and highest performing e-bikes on market. Um, prior to that, as you said, I was a Stanley Black and Decker leading the direct to consumer initiative for a couple of the brands there. Um, Interesting um, role at Sandy Black & Decker as it was the first time the organization had decided to go DTC, uh, always been retailer, um, but that was a shift that happened during the pandemic. And prior to that, I was at Hearst um, within the entertainment division leading the direct-to-consumer channel there as well. Um, And amongst all the roles, you know, Direct to consumer is similar, but when you have different brands, different price points, different areas of industries, creates so much difference, um, but yet so much excitement and real challenges to to grow businesses. Um, I'm really excited uh, to talk through that today with you, Isaac. Great. I know. And that actually leads up to the first question I had, which is you've had such a storied career within some big brands and what you just said was very uh, intriguing because you've actually built the brands up from scratch you built up their entire dcc operation from scratch in many cases or even just got it off the ground and actually stimulated it so what was that experience like operationally to get a brand going more direct to consumer when they historically have not invested as much or never did it before yeah so to me it's exciting 
Um, I've done it a couple times. Uh, w- one of the most memorable ones was when I was at OXO. Um, I joined the organization and there was an e-commerce business, but it was not a direct-to-consumer business. Um, so it involved an entire business mindset shift, an entire business operation dissection to really build out what direct-to-consumer is. And this was pre-COVID. So this is when we had to be extremely cautious of retailers, didn't want to cannibalize that audience, didn't want to cannibalize an Amazon business and build out a, a, a fully sustainable and profitable direct-to-consumer business. Um, I enjoy it because it allows me to essentially put the foundation in place, build upon that, establish what tech stacks we're using, what platforms we may be going with, identifying everything from our pricing strategies to our promotional strategies to what is our catalog strategy? How are we differentiating TTC online from any other channel? How are we creating, you know, retention? How are we retaining our, our, our audience? How are we going after new uh, customers that may be aware of the brand, may not have been aware of brand, and really putting all those strategies together and having it click. And once it clicks, you have this well-oiled machine that is now fully functional. And this is where you really have to drive that business. But I, I love it. I find it exciting. Others steer way clear of you know, establishing or building DTC from the ground up. They'd love to come in when it's already func- functional and, and, and running. I, I, I love that challenge of putting that together and making it successful. I like what you said about the mindset shift. It seems like that's a major part of it. You really got to kind of be the ambassador and steward of it and really get a lot of minds made up that this, this is the way to go, right? Yeah, I, you know, at a lot of organizations that are new to direct to consumer, it's really difficult because there is an investment that's needed, right? There is an investment that's needed, not just from uh, tools or, or, or infrastructure, but also from resources and personnel. Um, and that, that, sh- that mindset shift comes from a business perspective and being able to properly show on paper what is our investment and what is that return going to look like? Uh, a traditional non-direct to consumer business is not used to that. They don't, they don't understand asking for X amount of budget that you're not going to see return for in eight months because you're building this business. Um, a non-direct to consumer business that is going direct to consumer also doesn't understand the nuances and the problems that could come around with that, especially if you've been retail only or you've been B2B and now you're dabbling in D2C, you now have a whole different host of issues that are coming from retailers that may complain or may may start to threaten you for uh, what you are doing directly. And I think that is the whole mindset sh- mindset, mindset shift that needs to happen. Um, and it's a lot of it happens from the business side um, with the finance team. That's where it really starts. Yeah, it seems like the financial end of it is really kind of where you need to be. And I learned from one of my mentors out there, I said, math is the path. If you can you know, translate that math into it and it really makes sense, you know which way to go. Um, it's it's also interesting you said um, the competition between retailers. I know at Autorama, and you could probably be, share a story on that or share your background on it. When it came to retention, I always had to figure out ways to get a Canon buyer or a Sony shooter or a creator who was loyal to a certain brand to become more loyal to Autorama, right? To become loyal to the retailer. How do you navigate that with um, like a juice bike or an Oxo or anyone else that sells um, in other places? Um, how do you get them to be loyal to the brand and not just the retailer? Is there a secret out there? Yeah, I don't know if it's a secret. Um, I think it's really establishing and, and creating a real multiple real journeys in place that sell or, or or tell the consumer and they're buying into the brand first we want them to believe in the brand we want them to be um, someone that trusts in the brand we want them to realize that the brand is the authority for this product you can buy it from a retailer you can buy a product from um, target or costco or any retailer um, and you are essentially buying from that retailer you're buying a brand from that retailer Um, but purchasing from the actual brand and being able to translate that we are the brand authority because we are the brand. We actually do um, care about our customers because they are our brand loyalists. 
And a lot of the, the, the acquisition campaigns and a lot of the retention campaigns from the brand side really start with building that brand trust and building upon the brand loyalty we have and then engaging in the conversion journey after that. Whereas a lot of retailers really engage with conversion first, best price, coupon, et cetera. Um, on the brand side, we have a lot less um, promotion. We're a lot less promotional heavy. And consumers that purchase from, um, at least in my experience of the brands I've been at, are buying at full price. They, they don't care to use their 20% off coupon. They don't care to, to wait an extra day to get shipping because we'll never compete against Amazon, for example, in, in next day shipping. And I think that's really how we are, we are retaining and acquiring consumers is we're building upon what the brand authority is, why a consumer should purchase from the brand and what makes us different. Um, on the retailer side that are selling our products, they're getting information about why the retailer is best. Now the retailer isn't gonna focus in and hone in on those specific brands unless they are leveraging it for some example. Whereas on our side, we are telling our consumers, we've told our consumers, we have white glove customer service. We have the best warranties around. We have any products you need. If there's any product issues with warranties, you're not going through a third party. You're not going through a retailer, then come to us. We're building that, 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 that retention on how, you know, purchasing from the brand makes it easier for them. How does it build into their lifestyle? How does our brand then become part of their lifestyle? So we're selling the brand lifestyle first, and then we're, we're going after on conversion. That's huge. That brand lifestyle is so key. And I mentioned on another podcast, it seems to be that, you know, people are not as loyal to brands as they're loyal to communities. So I, I feel like brands have, you know, become, have grown up to become that community for a biker in this case, yeah. um, or a photographer or things like that. So that's, that's some pretty good insights. It seems like you guys have also migrated into that community for bikers, you'd say, right? Yeah. On the juice bike side, absolutely. We are um, fully intertwined into that community. Um, the, 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 the e-bike community is a specific, um, really exciting and excited audience. Um, and we, we are, intertwined into that we're building you know our message to them is how does juice spice help their community or their lifestyle better how do we make it easier how do we make it safer how do we make it more fun how do we make it more enjoyable and that's how we then layer on our product on top we just released a brand new bike and that's a great example because it's the first time we've gone into a, a fold the foldable category we have a foldable e-bike because we know that the the industry, because we know that like the lifestyle and those in that culture, our what we did was we layered upon what we know the bike enthusiasts want, which is power, speed, durability, and we layered that on top of a foldable bike because we know there's also a segment within the e-bike riders that want foldable bikes for nothing more than convenience. So that's how we approach it. We, so we are fully in tuned with what that community is, what they want, and how we better serve them. So we're not just pushing out products because we know they want something with two wheels and a motor. We're pushing out products because we know and we've heard what that community is looking for. And that's how we develop our products. Yeah, you've been on the cutting edge. You learn the data. You heard what customers are telling you. You react. That's what's really, really fantastic way of approaching a data-driven marketing program. Um, Absolutely. You know, can Considering, you know, I'm going to get to the more of the juice bikes questions in a second, but go, going back into your background, you know, in the role you're in as like the head of DTC and kind of getting people on board and getting buy-in, um, you got to probably get all these channels that have all these different goals and all these different metrics. You got to get your paid media team and your email team, merchandising team. And I know we dealt with a lot of that on Arama, but you had to get all these team buy-in and all these stakeholders to say, I'm in on the bigger goal. How do you navigate getting so many people to get on the same page and chart, you know, move the ship in the right direction? How do you manage that? Yeah, so the, how do I manage um, getting a lot of different personalities, a lot of different yeah. business business <laughs> goals in place? Um, Maybe you're a therapist, be... I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, how I operate, you know, I, I, I try to be as transparent as possible with all business partners. Um, I also make it pretty clear that this is not my direct-to-consumer business. This is our direct-to-consumer business. And in order to be successful, 
I need full cooperation from inventory planning. I need full cooperation from merchandising. I need to ensure that everyone is on the same page with the, what our digital marketing strategies are, on the same page with what we're doing with email, on the same page with how we were communicating to customers in on site, digital, uh, any paid media, email, off, off site channels, um, and ensuring that we as a whole believe in what we're doing. And when I say believe, it's really, you, you said it earlier, right? So, so putting that math on paper and ensuring that they, meaning any business partner I'm working with, understands this is our goal. This is the path how we are getting there. And in order to get this path, this is how your business unit helps support us. This is how another business unit helps support your business unit that helps support direct the consumer. And that's really how I try to get... Um, all business partners on board. At the end of the day, it's again, it's not my direct to consumer business, it's our direct to consumer business. And in order to make this fully and successfully um, function, we need all buy in. We have one weak link in this chain, and we're going to have problems down the road. Yeah, I definitely could see that. And I know how challenging it is to get all these personalities and all this kind of break down the barriers that typically some brands may have. I, I was in the retention world for a long you know, point of time, and I never really agreed with the goals that the acquisition team had, which was, you know, cost per acquisition. Like I was more focused on lifetime value and number of orders from email and channels like that. So getting that kind of breaking down that mindset and saying, you know, I have to rethink how I typically did things. So key. It seems that that's yeah. really where you really excel in. And it seems like it's, it's, you need it. Right. Yeah. And I think it's interesting what you just said as well, because there are some campaigns that we aren't looking at cost of acquisition because this entire campaign is all about branding and brand awareness. And then on the, uh, you know, on the email side, anyone that's leading that starts to panic because, you know, yeah. we're sending out, we're deploying emails, but we're not seeing the KPIs and goals that that team is marching towards, but that's okay because this campaign is not about delivering revenue. This campaign is about delivering brand awareness. So we know cost for acquisition is going to be off the chart. We know LTV is going to be screwed up, right, for this campaign because we are we are launching, let's say, a new product or we're making an announcement. And I think that is part of getting everyone on board because you know better than I do at the end of the month or the quarter of the year, you have one or two campaigns that aren't focused on CAC or aren't focused on LTV. It's going to throw off all the data, right? It's going to make it yeah. seem as if from your channel, you're not performing. However, sometimes we need to take a step back and understand this campaign is going to have an eight month you know, residual on the catch up. That's awesome. It's, it's great to even look in that direction. I know again, you know, when you're just like so close to the numbers, you're like, oh, am I making my numbers? Am I hitting my clicks and my opens and my goals and my retention goals? But seeing the big picture is so, so, so important. And that kind yeah. of brings me to my next question regarding juice bikes. And probably it's even more important now post pandemic, um, from what I've seen, you know, everyone gravitated towards biking right yep. when the pandemic hit, everyone wanted to get out and go get on a bike and go ride. And that probably accelerated a whole bunch of these one-time buyers into your customer list, into your database. How are you, what are you doing right now to kind of either keep them buying more often and retain them long-term, or are you finding that they are just not as valuable anymore and they haven't, um, you know, unlock the true potential um, with juice bikes. Is there a, any, any ideas on that? Yeah. So the, the, there is a segment of the, of the audience or, or a customer base that will never, will never become a repeat customer. And it's exactly what you just said, right? During the pandemic, there was so much unknown where everyone was buying an e-bike because one, they were bored sitting at home Two, They couldn't get, you couldn't get a traditional bicycle anywhere. Right. right? And then three, because of that unknown, I may have to start commuting to an office. I'm not going to take public transportation. I'm not going to sit in the bus with everyone coughing. I'm not going to sit in the train with everyone coughing, right? And at, coming out of the pandemic, there is a segment of that popular of that audience that we know will never convert again. And I think, from my perspective, it is a gradual fall off of those consumers, of those customers that are not engaging anymore that we have organically taken them out of our 
out of our database, we're no longer messaging to them because we've seen no engagement, no interaction from them. There's also a much larger uh, customer base that has purchased and, and became a first time purchaser during the pandemic and fell in love with it. And those are the customers that we see coming back for accessories or upgrades or purchasing a second or third or fourth bike for their wife, their spouse, their husband, their kids or gifting it. And that is the segment that we are seeing significant growth on. And that is the real audience that we have developed retention, remarketing, their, their email journeys that are specifically tailored towards them. We've also dissected it out into, into geographic um, or geo-targeted campaigns, whether an email or paid media to really drive those customers to, to repurchase or to, or to continue that LTV or build upon LTV. And, you know, that's how that's here at Juiced. And also when I was at Stanley Black & Decker, it was, it was in the prime of the, of the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic. And it was very similar, right? We had customers that were purchasing because they were home bored and wanted to do renovations and coming out of the pandemic it was how do we continue to upsell to these customers to purchase now that they're not home anymore now that they're in an office how do we continuously engage them into purchasing product types and a lot of that happened by developing journeys that were showing the cons the customer what they can do at home here's an idea here's a renovation here's a quick fix here's the tools you need to get it done and we did see success in that that's huge you mentioned that because i think within the bike world also it just showed that you know sometimes brands also pivot based on or not really pivot it's more like they adjust their forecast they adjust their p l based on what they saw in the pandemic i've heard a lot of bike companies have stocked up on inventory because they saw that rise in biking but something has been challenging to navigate that when the dip comes again, right? Would you say? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, you know, here at Juice Bikes, we're in a really good position because we didn't over, o o over, you know, we didn't go too deep in inventory and we didn't go too little in inventory. There are other bike manufacturers out there, bike brands out there, they're sitting on an extreme amount of inventory, right? There are other manufacturers, there are other brands out there, they're sitting on too little inventory. And they're having problems from that standpoint. I think we did a really good job here um, adjusting in real time with our inventory to ensure that we weren't in a position where we're out of stock or we're in a position where we're overstocked. For overstocked, what ends up happening is, and this is what we're seeing in, in the industry, many of these brands who are overstocked, they're dropping their price significantly and they're yeah. taking losses on the products just to move it out of the warehouse. And then you have the brands that are understocked that didn't plan properly that are just selling accessories today. So we did a really good job here, not just from inventory planning pre, during and post pandemic, but also in new product planning. We've already released two bikes um, in the last four months, uh, five months. So we, we, we did a really good job here on that. That's awesome. It's great to see such great inventory management and hopefully that will ride up, you know, to the rest of the year and maybe even the next year after that. And um, it's interesting you mentioned that because one thing that I have a question on would be you have about four different type of bike categories. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, we have a uh, adventure, high speed, commuter and cruiser. Mm -hmm. And are you seeing any anomalies or different retention statistics based on the type of bike they're buying, you know, a commuter, Spot, uh, different retention rate for a New York City commuter versus an adventure biker over in, uh, I don't know, Utah or something? Yeah. I, I think it's seasonal, right? And I say that because as spring start, as spring has sprung this year and we're getting into the nicer weather, um, a lot of the adventure type bikes are the ones that are extremely popular. During the fall and winter, it's more of those cruisers. It's more of the commuter type bikes, the bigger, the bigger tire bikes. Um, and this time of year, it seems to be a lot more adventure and speed, right? So those that want to get out on a trail, those that want to go off, off road riding, that type of bike is extremely popular this time of year. Um, and then the fall and winter, it's more of that urban commuter type bike. And it may be someone that is commuting 
in the city and trying to get from their home to the office, you know. Um, so I think it's seasonal. And at least that is my my experience here at Juice Bikes. That's interesting to say that because it seems like um, no matter where you are, um, the season dictates how you spend it. Like I, I would think in New York City, you're not going to find as many high speed bikers, but maybe I'm totally wrong. Um, maybe they're, you know, these are for the food delivery guys that are racing at high speed down, <laughs> down the road. Yeah, and, sure. that, and that is a segment of our audience, right? A segment of our yeah. audience is last mile deliveries, whether it's food or packages. And we have bikes wow. that do satisfy that need. Um, and that is also an extremely popular bike um, in urban areas, right? Like, like cities, New York yeah. City, LA, San Diego, Chicago, right. those type cities that have high last mile delivery on bicycle. Wow, fascinating. So, I mean, yeah. we talked about some of the good news and what you're doing really well. You guys have done some really great things on your inventory management, your PL, and everything like that. Um, now, but there's also some bad news out there, right? We hear things about e-bike fires and batteries, you know, causing fires, if I'm not mistaken. And maybe it's just isolated situations. But how do you deal with like global bad news that may affect that retention and may affect how you keep customers loyal to your brand? Hopefully it doesn't happen to you guys, but like how do you how do you manage that, you know, that crisis? I think you know, we we are we are self protected from that because our batteries are our batteries and bikes are UL certified. So we we that is part of our communication, right? If anybody has any doubt against it, we are certified. We are UL certified. Our, our, some of our batteries have um, a built in function where if you've left it plugged in for an extended period of time, it's going to turn off and stop charging. So we have built in some safety and security features in our product to ensure that you know, recently, he, I think here in New York City, recently they just arrested a bike shop owner because he had um, batteries that were not certified, batteries that can self implode and catch fire. We okay. here have our batteries are UL certified, so it's not. We we have taken the measures to ensure that we've um, manufactured our our batteries to the to the standards that are out there. So a lot of that negative news doesn't necessarily affect us because we use the positive on it on, hey, our batteries or our bikes are UL certified. They are safe. Anything. And it's also where it also creates a, a, a talking point for us to caution out any potential or unsure customers on who are looking to purchase a bike just based on price point. You can go buy a $600 bike. It may or may not work and it may or may not self implode and catch on fire. <laughs> so, right. So there's that. Yeah. There's that. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to necessarily put your kid on that bike, you know, because it may blow up. So that's, right. but that's great to see your positioning in that, in that way. And probably it's the foresight you guys have thought about in terms, like you said, that good merchandising and good product, you know, forecasting that's worked for you guys and listening to the data that your customers are telling you. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of it has to do with our founder, Tora Harris. Um, he's always from day one, He's always wanted to build and deliver to the consumer a high quality, safe product. And, you know, it, we don't cut any edges, which is why our, our, our bike that was just released last week, almost four years of research and development to ensure the safety and the, 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 the excitement and the happiness from a consumer. So that's part of it as well. And, and, and he, that's something that he is extremely proud about and drives home in anything, whether it's an accessory that costs $10 or a bike that costs $2,700. Wow. That's huge to have that long horizon of data, R&D, and just understanding what's yep. what's working, especially considering we're literally about four years post-pandemic when it disrupted yep. everything. Um, so pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, when you're thinking about retention, when you're thinking about um, all the things out there, right, and you've been through a ton of them with OXO, Juice, you know, Black & Decker, there's so many different things when it comes to retention, like email, SMS, direct mail, um, you know, coupons, loyalty, you name it. What is something you think that maybe you want to put on your retention roadmap this year? Something you are dying to try out. Um, I'll give an example. One of our past podcast guests had mentioned that they're trying out direct mail for a change, you know, and that was the buzz eight years ago or whatever it is, and they're trying it again. Is there anything on your retention roadmap that you guys are saying, you know what, we should give this a go? Or maybe something that was like, you know what, let's, let's sunset it. From now on 
Yeah, it's very interesting you said that. And um, I, I think direct mail is becoming a buzz again, um, which is funny. Um, you know, the, I've had some conversations and I, I've done some research on how do we begin to integrate direct mail as part of a retention or conversion journey. And I'm not thinking of, hey, let's send out 2 million mailers, QR codes and see what happens. I'm thinking more specific as far as, hey, maybe we had an abandoned cart and we know a specific abandoned, we know that specific product and we know that product has a six week life cycle from research to purchase, then maybe in our retention or our upsell or our abandonment journey, we build in a postcard or we build in a flyer that's sent out to the customer's home address. Um, you know, so I would say one item is perhaps direct mail, right? As long as it, it makes sense. I think the other aspect to it also is um, voice, voice activation. Um, because our, because when you're riding a bike, you're using both hands and at times of riding a bike, a, a consumer may then think, Hey, I need to get X, Y, Z, or, Hey, I should probably purchase this new helmet, or I should probably purchase this upgrade or control. So my bike can go from 20 miles an hour to 28 miles an hour. And I think that's where voice activation really helps because We've never done it here, but if somebody's on the bike, everybody has a smartwatch or, or seven out of 10 people have a smartwatch, right? If we can engage in voice activation and have someone purchase or place an order through voice, through search, I think that is huge for us. Um, so I think those are the two areas or channels that I'd like to dip my toe in this year and see how it performs. Those are great aspirations, and that's that's amazing to see you're diving into these new, not 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 just a traditional channel that you know maybe people have either forgotten and really want to dust off, but also this new cool channel of voice activation. And it reminds yeah. me of um, someone I had, I um, you know, one of my friends who actually was a biker, and they were stuck on you know up a mountain, got a flat tire, right? Imagine you had some voice activation elements that say like, you know what, <laughs> it's not gonna help me now, but yeah. future state, buy a, a tire pump that I could take with me or whatever it may be. Yeah. So yeah, a lot I mean, of good applications there. Yeah, I, you know, a couple. I, I, I um, I used to ride tr non-powered bikes myself, and a couple of years ago, I took a fall and I broke some bones, and I think the only thing I had at that time was the, my watch, right? Voice activation on my watch to really wow. call for help or get anything I needed, and that's really where years ago had this idea, how do I better integrate, how do we integrate this into selling products as bad as it sounds, right? How do we integrate into selling products? And that's where it sparked to, to your, to, to, to your comment just now. And it's now I think here at Juice Bikes, it really creates a, a good opportunity to try some of that. Right. Yeah, definitely born out of necessity, really huge. Yeah. Um, good, good call out there. The, the last piece I'll say about the direct mail piece is I think the reason why a lot of brands or DTC businesses are looking at it is because organically over the last couple of years, we get so much less mail in our mailbox <laughs> that there's a lot more attention placed on what comes in the mail. So I hope it doesn't turn into a place where everyone starts set, sending again direct mail and then mailboxes get overloaded and junk. Right, right. It has, gets expensive too. So you kind of know that if you're doing it, you got to do it well. And I love your idea about the yeah. card abandoned mailers. I think that would definitely move the needle pretty well. Yeah. So Absolutely. we're about out of time. Thanks for giving me a few extra minutes here. But uh, one last thing in terms of like, where can people learn about Juiced Bikes or where do you recommend they go or uh, if they want to learn more about the brand or yourself? Yeah, juicebikes.com. Check us out. Um, learn as much as you want about our brand. Purchase as many bikes as you want. Um, and you can find me on LinkedIn, Andrew Mosco. Perfect. Any final retention tips or insights you would give to a brand that's looking to kind of level up to the next level right now? Yeah, I, I would say be patient. I think a lot of times we, we go into retention activation um, campaigns and we want to see results immediately. Um, I think patience is the key to this because you know, you, you are launching or, or kicking off a campaign and you're not going to see the results you want in an hour, two hours, maybe even two weeks. 
And I think the patient side of it is being able to adjust and adapt and change that campaign and refine it until you get to that point of maximum efficiency. Good tip, really expert tip right there. Patience, test, learn, refine, you'll get there in no time. Well, yep. thanks Andrew for joining us. This has been really great um, having you on this episode and uh, teaching us all about what you're doing really well at uh, Juice Bikes and all the other brands you've been at. Awesome, thank you, Isaac, appreciate it. For sure. So thank you all for listening to another episode of the Retention Nation podcast and learning firsthand from Andrew how he's helping Juice Bikes turn one-time and sometime buyers into lifetime buyers and actually unlocking the true revenue potential from his customers and definitely creating scalable revenue streams. And uh, they're on the they're on that path. They're on that race towards the uh, ultimate goal, probably being the biggest bike brand and the best bike brand in the world. So thank you for joining this episode and I will see you on the next one. Thanks for listening to the Retention Nation podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe and join our Retention Nation Facebook group. If you want to put this week's retention strategy into action within minutes, all done for you by our expert email SMS and retention team, you can go to highflydigital.com slash book for a free 15-minute chat with myself and my team. It's time to turn those one-time and sometime buyers on your list into lifetime buyers and unlock the revenue you deserve. Your brand is worth it and your customers will thank you for it. Until next week, I'm Isaac Hyman wishing you a successful and profitable week.